it's got various names, the uh, Omega Nebula, it's called the Swan Nebula, someone's called it the Lobster Nebula. It's a cluster of stars in the Milky Way, but which is one which is enveloped with a, within a kind of dusty, gas-rich region. It's a bit like, a bit like Orion Nebula, in the sense that basically it's a young star-forming region that's only a few million years old. So there's lots of very young, hot, luminous, bright stars in the centre, and, those, and the radiation from those stars is illuminating the gas around it. The first ever view of, of M17 was, it was discovered before Messier's catalogue, maybe 20 years or so before. But he was the kind of first one to kind of publicise it, really. Um, but the, but the, names, the, the names of, of it, the first name really that stuck is the Omega Nebula. And that really results from John Herschel, his description of it. And in fact, there's an image here which shows it's basically like a capital Omega, showing this kind of structure, um, which is kind of explains why it got given the Omega Nebula name. But the one I prefer, actually, is, is the, the one which came a bit later on, uh, which is a Swan Nebula. And so, again, a later view, this is now from Chambers, from the late 19th century. This is his view of, again, it's, it's essentially this part here, showing the the swan-like appearance of uh, M17. And in fact, I'll, I have a, a, higher, a higher quality view of, the, of, of M17. Um, it, it allows you to, to see actually that there is some truth in the kind of swan-like appearance. So actually what I have here is, uh, is a view of, of M17 from the ESO VLT. But it's not an optical view, it's an infrared view. Someone taken at, at, at wavelengths just longer than the wavelengths of light that our, our eyes are sensitive to. Uh, our eyes are sensitive to light between about 400 and 700 nanometers. This is light at uh, one or two microns. So it's a few, it's a sh longer wavelengths, shorter energy light. So it's sensitive both to the stars, which are basically embedded within this dusty star forming region. Uh, this is a bit like Orion, it's further away, about a factor of four times further away. So it takes light about 5,000 years to get from M17 to us. Um, but it's it's more impressive than Orion in the sense that it's not just really one or two stars which is powering this nebula, but it's got like a hundred OB stars, and it's the OB stars with this powerful UV radiation fields that powers these nebula. So it's bigger, and it's actually a lot more impressive. If you could look at these things too at the same distance, it's a much brighter nebula than Orion is. It shows a central region of uh, M17, and this is a central cluster. So these are the stars which are powering, ionizing the gas, all the hydrogen gas around it. This is dusty regions here and dusty region here. And the, and the reason it's called, it's been called a swan actually, is that there's kind of a, a kind of a, a, a disc, like the body of the swan here, and the head is kind of in this shape here. So this is really why in optical light it's, it's been described as a swan nebula. I've seen other ones which look much more like a lobster, to be honest. Um, but it's, the, it's, this, it's these stars in the center of M17 which kind of show up reasonable optical, optical wavelengths, but show up really strikingly in the infrared, where, you're, where, the, where, the, where the light is actually piercing through this dusty environment. You know, the reason that, reason places that stars form are rich in gas, rich in dust, and it's these gassy, dusty regions that the infrared light, in this case observed with the Very Large Telescope in Chile, allows us to kind of see the stars much clearer and actually look through a lot of this obscuring dust. Is it illuminated or ionised? It's being, in, in some cases, the uh, reflection nebulae tend to be like the horsehead nebula, are uh, illuminated. In this case, they're ionised. It's the gas, the gas we're seeing here is hydrogen gas that's basically being ionised by the ultraviolet radiation field of the hot luminous stars in, in the centre of that region. Is it in the proximity of the stars or is it a long, long way away? Um, well, it depends. Everything, everything's relative, of course. I mean, it, it's in closest proximity in the sense of it's probably uh, a light year away or so. Um, the, in other words, the, the stars probably already cleared the, the gas away from its immediate environment. These, uh, these O stars have probably formed two or three million years ago, so they've probably cleared away the gas and the dust from their immediate environments. But the gas further away, still within the larger star forming region, there's still stars forming there. Is it like glowing though? If I, if I was there in a spacesuit just floating in the gas, yeah. would I be surrounded by this amazing glowing material? You would. Yeah, yeah, I mean basically the, the gas is glowing uh, and so this is all into the infrared view, opt op the optical historical um, drawings and images do actually show that the, the it looked look like red because it's mostly the light, the hydrogen gas is ionized and actually it's primarily 
uh, the combination line of hydrogen called Balmer Alpha, which is, which is light, which is bright in uh, red light. Actually, it would look kind of mostly ready with a few kind of twinges of kind of bluey light from other uh, lines of, for example, oxygen, also lights up in the kind of greeny, bluey part of the spectrum. So it would look, it would look like a glowing amount of gas. Now, the gas, of course, is really low density. It's not like the air in, in our room. It's, 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 it's billions or trillions of times less dense. So, it's, so the, the gas here is dense in kind of galactic terms, but incredibly tenuous from, from respect to the Earth's environment. Is it only special kind of stars that have the power to illuminate gas like this? Yes. Yeah, so, for example, the sun, when it was forming, wasn't, uh, even now it's not hot enough to actually um, ionise the hydrogen gas, which is in its close proximity. The, but these things, these things are typically five times or so hotter at the surface than the sun. And so because they're much hotter, they've got much more intense radiation fields, and that higher energy output is required to cause hydrogen to be ionised. So the sun, in its wild and reckless teen years, yeah. would never have had the honour of illuminating a nebula like this? No, no. So really, the, the places where we see these ionised regions, like Orion, uh, M42, like the Omega Nebula or Swan Nebula or uh, M17, these are the ones which have these very massive, very luminous, very hot stars in their, in their centres, which are things that power the, power the nebula. You guys are very good at spotting when stars die, if they die in the right way. Yes. Supernova. Can you spot stars being born, the moment of birth? Is there a, is there a signature of a star's moment of birth? That not, not really, because it's such a slow process. It's the the po point of death is instantaneous. It's basically, it goes between, between, the co the, between the star's core collapsing and the supernova explosion happens in a, in a second or so. At the point of formation, the sun, for example, probably took 10 million years to form. These, these massive stars may form in 100,000 years. So they're in a form, the process of forming over a very, very long time frame. So, so it's not like one, one minute a star is still forming and the next minute it's on the main sequence. It happens over a very slow process, typically thousands of years. So it's difficult often telling whether a star's still accreting material and still forming as a protostar, or it's actually just turned on, actually it's lost all that material and it's actually then now just a main sequence dwarf star. So there's no ignition point, there's no, not like a nuclear bomb when it goes off, it doesn't ignite in its centre and suddenly start glowing. Well it does, but it glows, it already glows before it's actually, nu nuclear reactions are going on in the centre. So it glows more, more from a contraction, so really it, the reason it, it shines even before it's undergoing nuclear reactions actually is it's contracting, and it's contracting, it's heating up, and actually it's, it's glows, it shines as a protostar. So we can see lots of protostars where they're still forming, but, but the point at which the nuclear reactions go on there's no way of directly knowing at what that point is from one star to the next.